welcome to our XOR Engineer training series. This series is for those wanting to build upon, customize, or even create new content within Cortex XOR. We'll be focusing our efforts around the development of a use case to respond to an alert that is consuming time for our fictional security operations center. Along the way, we'll be covering the following, alert ingestion, classification and mapping, layouts, building playbooks and sub-playbooks, writing various automation scripts, looping, extending context, and more. Cortex XOR, typically everything we do starts with a use case. This becomes our blueprint to respond to an event, an alert, or a problem that we are wanting to solve with just a little automation. As we mentioned in this series, we'll be building out a use case to respond to an alert that our SOC is spending time responding to manually and try to solve the following problems for them. One, implement a consistent response process to this alert by leveraging a playbook. Two, save time by performing automated triage of the alert, gathering information about users and indicators of compromise from the alert. And three, gain efficiency in time to respond and remediate by automating the remediation steps that analysts are currently performing manually and guiding analysts in how to use them. A great place to start when defining a use case is our XOR use case definition template, which is available on Live Community. Let's take a look at the use case definition that we'll be building this use case from. Using the use case definition template allows us to more rapidly implement our use case, as with just a little planning, we can often address the what ifs and what do I need before we start any development. Now for our use case, we have the following template that we'll be using as our blueprint and we'll cover the various pieces of this in the following videos. But at a high level, a good use case strives to capture the following. First of all, the trigger. Where are we getting these alerts from and how are they getting into XOR? In our case, our alerts are coming from a sample event generator that has been built for this training. Next, the classification. Are there different alerts from this source integration and do we need different incident types within XOR to handle them? In this case, our integration produces alerts for URLs which have been allowed or blocked, and we'll be handling them with a single incident type with an XOR. Next, the mapping. What key data do we need from this alert, and which XOR fields might we use to hold that data? In this case, we require information from the alert, such as the user who clicked, the URL they clicked, and perhaps even the source IP that they clicked from. Next, Alerts may contain many different IOCs, but which ones are important for our, our response and our triage, and which do we need to enrich through threat intelligence lookups? In our case, our alert contains a suspicious URL for which we want the URL and domain indicators, a source IP address for which we want to extract and only enrich external IPs, and the username, which comes in the form of an email address. And we can tell XOR to be very specific into which indicators it extracts and enriches through threat intelligence lookups. Next, the layout. What information do we need to show to analysts, often driven by the information they are going to research manually or need in order to review and remediate the case, or things that they might add to case notes? In this case, we need all the information that we might get from mapping, as well as information such as the manager name and email address, and any detected or external inter IP addresses. Next, in order to build a playbook, we need to define our response process. This often can be determined by existing runbooks or simply asking analysts how they respond to this alert today and what important information they require and what actions they are currently taking to respond or remediate to this, this alert. In our case, Analysts are retrieving information about the source user and their manager from Active Directory, and in the event of a true positive, they are resetting the user's password and blocking the URL. Next, we can define other information about our use case. Again, what indicators we might want to reach out and enrich, what pieces of information we might want to automatically enrich or triage for the analyst prior to them reviewing the alert. In this case, we want to re reach out to threat intelligence for the domain and URL, the source IP if it's external, as well as retrieve information about the user, such as their SAM account name, their manager, and any group information. 
If there are any manual steps that the analyst may need to take as part of reviewing or responding to this alert, we can define these as well. In our case, in the event that no suspicious or malicious indicators are found from our threat intelligence lookups, we will present the analyst a manual task to select whether they should remediate this or close it as a false positive. We can also define any deduplication logic we may want to apply to bring in only the alerts that are important to our SOC. In this case, our SOC has told us that they do not review alerts for which the URL was already blocked or the URL is spam. In addition, if the source integration produces repeat alerts, we can use pre-processing to deduplicate these if we already have an incident for that alert. In this case, we have the same source user and the same URL, then we should drop that new alert and add it to the existing incident if that existing incident is not already closed. Next, we can define which integrations we need in order to make this use case a reality. In this case, we require integration with Active Directory to retrieve user information, manager information, and group memberships. We'll be using our generic indicator export service to add URLs to be blocked by our firewall. And then for this training, we have an integration which produces randomized threat intelligence for URLs and domains, which will give us some nice information to train from. And then lastly, we can define any custom fields we may need. XOR has many fields out of the box. However, in the event we do not have fields to hold the information that we are interested in, we can add new ones and, of the, and define which types these fields should be. In this case, we'll be creating a field to hold our suspicious URL, as well as the URL category from the alert itself. Lastly, our blueprint provides us the goal that we are building towards, but it is not set in stone and can be adjusted along the way if required. In addition, remember that use cases are often iteratively improved, so using a plan, do, check, act approach is always encouraged. Now that we've given a quick overview of the use case, let's quickly review some of the activities we've already done in our XOR instance in preparation for development. First of all, we've configured the required integrations we need. This was done from settings, integrations, and instances. We can filter down to enabled. We've configured the Active Directory query integration, which we'll use to look up user and manager information, the generic indicator export service, which we will be using to output URLs to an external dynamic list that our firewall might use to block the URL. And then lastly, we've configured our random threat intelligence integration, which is used for this training to randomize threat intel just to keep things interesting. Now, as XOR engineers, it's important to understand the commands that an integration can perform, which is useful in use case planning and development. We recommend reviewing the commands an integration brings to show what is or isn't possible with a given integration. For example, under Active Directory Query V2, we can click Show Commands and review the commands that this integration is, is capable of. For instance, we need to use AD Get User to retrieve user information from Active Directory. It's always advisable to review the integrations you're intending to use and the commands that are available to them. This gives you a clue whether or not what you're intending to do is even possible. Next, when configuring integrations, and we'll use our generic indicator export service as an example, when adding an instance, always review the helpful guides on the right-hand side um, for how to configure and use this particular integration instance. It can often give you a clue how to use it, what credentials you might require, or what the various configuration options mean dependent on the integration. In addition, always remember you can scroll down and click View Integration Do Documentation to be driven out to our XOR PAN dev site for more information. Lastly, in preparation for this, we've also excluded the private IP ranges to prevent IP indicators from these ranges from being extracted. This was done under advanced and exclusion list. And you can see we have excluded the 10.172, 192, 168 CIDR ranges for IP indicator types. We'll cover why we did this later in the series. Quick review to wrap this video up. Remember to always start with a use case. A little bit of planning goes a long way. As XOR engineers, review integration commands to determine what an integration can and cannot do which often dictates what is possible with your use case. And lastly, make sure to configure any required integrations that you need 
to start building out the use case. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.